Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5. We'll read down to um, verse 9, I believe. It says, For unto the angels had he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. It said, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? You can put your name there. What am I that, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Who is Ben that thou art mindful of him? He says, or the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Now, we are all Bible students in this church, so you know that when it says a little lower than the angels, the Greek word there is Elohim. And um, that's referring to the plurality of God because the word translated means gods. Thou has made him a little lower than the gods. And so sometimes the translators take the liberty to decide what exactly the writer must have meant. So it would be correct to say thou has made him a little lower than yourself. One translation says that he missed deity by an air's breath. He missed deity by an air's breath. It says, and you did set him over the works of your hands. Verse 8, can we read together verse 8? One to go. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. How many things are put in subjection under his feet? Is there anything left out? Come on, talk to me. How many things are put under his feet? All things. Thou, who put all things under his feet? God. God put absolutely everything under his feet. He says, for in that he put all in subjection under him. And so as to stress the thought again, look at what he says. Read that next sentence. They want to go. He left nothing that is not put under him. So how many things are under him? All things. Now, can we read that next sentence? But now, we see not yet all things put under him. So let me ask you a question. Could you just drop it a bit? Thank you. Let me ask you a question. How many things did he put under him? All things. Is anything excluded? He says, thou hast put all things under him. And so that you do not assume anything, he repeats it. He says, but can, I, can you go back to... Okay, verse 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Do you agree with me? That's tautology. The three um, phrases there all refer to the same thing. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. Is there any difference? Then again, he left nothing that is not put under under him so that you have no doubt that all things are under him but then he says something but now we see not yet all things put under him the contradictions we find in our lives he says God has put all things under him there's no question that he's put all things under him he repeats it two times more so that you know he says, but sometimes when we look into our lives, it looks almost as though not all things are under him. Have you ever felt that way before? You've, you, you're, you're shouting with one mouth. <laughs> I am seated. Okay, thank you. Son of oil. And you know that you're a son of oil. How many of you know you are sons of oil? You know, and by the way, I hope you know son of oil is a global phenomenon. <laughs> I'm telling you, I go everywhere and I see son of oil everywhere. It's a global thing. Praise God. Son of oil, son of oil. But by the time you look into your pocket, there's no oil. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the way you're laughing... I think that's the pain point tonight, right? <laughs> Glory to God. How many of you ever said to yourself, Jesus said, I'd lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And you went in that authority, that consciousness, you know 
that if I lay hands on the sick, they will recover. And rather than recovering, I'll tell you two stories before I get into what I want to share with you tonight. Years ago, when our, we're going to have a first public meeting as a church, I was younger than this, obviously. And um, I think with age, um, a little wisdom comes along with age. I think so. Well, I believed God's word. I believe that everything God said is true and will be so. So I told them, first day, church was to open. I said, bring every blind that you know. Bring every lame that you know. And I went on, I think it was a three-day fast or something like that. I went on a fast. I came ready for the devil. It was a video. I'd like to tell you that I prayed for them and they saw. But this is the altar of God. They did not see. They didn't see. Pastor Jola would remember, I think I started with the guy on a scooter. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I realized my faith was being drained. Because he wasn't going to stand up. I said, stand up. <laughs> he looked at me and said, I cannot. <laughs> and the whole church was looking at me. The whole church, I had promised them Jesus was going to show up. So I left him. I went to the guy who was blind. In the name of Jesus, see, see. God said, I'll lay my hands on this. Blah, 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 blah. Can you see? No. Open your eyes. I said, see. <laughs> Finally, he said something that delivered me. You know, you can't catch a pastor. You know what he said? He said, it's looking cloudy. I said, that's it. That's it. I needed that deliverance. Because how do you stop praying and tell them he didn't see? I said, the work has started. As you go back home, the anointing is in your body. Everybody rejoice. I knew he wasn't going to see. He didn't see. I didn't hear from him after. And I was glad. Praise God. But let me tell you another story. I was called somewhere to minister just some weeks ago. And um, I'll tell you two stories side by side. And when I was done, it was Friday night. Oscar was with me. I was done Friday night. Great meeting. Sweating like Christmas goat. Um, poured out my heart. Then they said there was a Saturday morning session and it was minister session. I said, all right. Then he added, we're bringing all the sick. I didn't mind. I mean, thank God we've seen the miraculous power of God in, in our lives. So I didn't mind, but I wasn't ready. You know how you prepare for a healing meeting. I ate well the day before, so I didn't have the chance to. <laughs> and I knew I was tired, so I knew I was going to sleep. Pastor Steve, I woke up. The meeting was about 8 a.m. or something like that. I woke up about 6 a.m. I said, mercy, Lord. I, I said, Lord, Jesus, that son of David, don't embarrass your servants. <laughs> Well, but you can't show it. I went into the hall, preached a powerful message. I scanned around. There was no sick person. I was happy. I said, thank you, Jesus. I can go. As I got to the door, Pastor Steve, the pastor said, Pastor, hold on, hold on. There's somebody I wanted you to minister to. He brought a lady with stage four cancer. You were there. Stage four cancer. I almost vomited from the stench. Her breast completely eaten up by the cancer. And he said to me, he said, Pastor, the doctor said there's nothing they can do again. He had metastasized into, I mean, I, I couldn't even pray just for the stench. I turned, I said, in Jesus' name, you know the prayer you pray, you know, God did not hear, you did not hear, the per Satan did not hear. Be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. And I walked away. I was sure I wasn't going to hear anything. Weeks after, I get a phone call. Missed it second time. Missed it third time. Finally, I was able to speak with him. He said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. He said, I just visited the lady. He said, everything is dried up. He said, there's just a little part left. There's just a little part left of the saw and the injury. He said, I, I actually believe the pastor will be listening because he, he joins our services. He said, pastor, he said she has added weights. They held her hands to come into the meeting. He said, pastor, they told me, I, I said, I want to see it myself. 
He said, I went to see her. I walked around the area. He said, people were shocked seeing her because normally they don't see her. She had been condemned indoors. He said, pastor, she's the picture of life and vitality now. Now, here's where I'm going to. There was a time I didn't see everything as yet under him. But I believed it. I believed it. In essence, hear this. There will be, please sit down. There will be seasons of contradiction in your life. Where you believe something, but you experience the other. Where this is what you know to be true. If they caught you halfway, this is what you know to be true. You can put your life on the line for it. But when we look into your life and your experiences and your circumstances, you will find out that it's the exact opposite. What do we do? Can I have the next verse? And I want us to read just the first four words there. Want to go. But we see Jesus. This is important. It says, while everything else may look as though they are running a rampage, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The Bible says that the serpents were biting them. And what did God say to Moses? He said, put up a brazen serpent, a brazen serpent representing judgment. He didn't say that I will kill the serpents. I will do anything about the serpents. God didn't kill the serpents. But he said, if they look on the serpent, what they look at will determine their experiences eventually. It will determine the experiences eventually. He says, but we see Jesus. Put it back. He says, but we see Jesus. He says, everything, we know that everything is put under him. But when we put it side by side, our experience, it doesn't look that same way. Sometimes you are tempted almost to put aside your convictions and your faith. He says, but we see Jesus. Pastor Benny Hinn said something very powerful that changed my life. He said, you know why we worship? He said, people think that we like to sing. He said, that's not the reason. He said, for in that moment of worship, the sick one gets to a point where he stops seeing his sickness. He said, the moment you see Jesus, the sickness will disappear. It's an exchange. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying here? It's an exchange. It's an exchange. He said, the moment your eyes behold him, he said, literally, as it were, and why are we singing the songs we're singing? Not because we want to sound nice, not because the music is great. That's not the reason. Ultimately, it's because we want to behold something. Are you following what I'm saying here? And it's not just something. Say with me, he's someone. This sight is not the sight of the eyes. I'm just sharing very briefly with you so that you can worship with understanding. It's not the sight of the eyes. But the sight of your inner man, a conscious awareness, it's a moment in time where you become consciously aware of the person, the character and the ministry of Jesus. It's a moment, literally, you know at that point where you become consciously aware of who this Jesus is. Now, the interesting thing is this is you cannot carry that thing with you. Every time, you would have to press in afresh. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? That's why some people carry stale bread everywhere. Because they didn't press in afresh. It's that moment in time where you become consciously aware of the person, the character, and the ministry of Jesus. And it overwhelms, literally overwhelms, submerges all knowledge and all fact around you. At that moment, there may be a pain in your body, but you just can't believe it. You've seen something greater. Is somebody following what I'm saying here? Please listen very carefully to this. You have to understand why we worship. It's not a concert. Say with me, it's an exchange. Come on, say with me, it's not a concert. It's an exchange. Now, the interesting thing here is this. He said, I hear a lot of people use this balance, but we see Jesus. And they, they say all of those things and they sound really smart. They sound um, theologically accurate and all the rest. But can I tell you something? You can know everything and actually teach it accurately without seeing him. Oh, Luke chapter 24 tells us. Go study it. 
The disciples were on the way to Emmaus. You may have studied it for yourself. They were on the way to Emmaus. And the Bible says two of them were discussing about the things that had happened in Jerusalem. And then Jesus himself walked by them. Have you ever read that story? And the Bible says he asked them. Can you put up the reference there on the screen? He says he asked them. He said, hey, what are you guys talking about? They said, don't you know what has been happening in Jerusalem? Are you? They were upset that he was asking that kind of question. Guess what Jesus said? He said, all right, can I join the journey and have a conversation with you? And the Bible says Jesus himself expounded from Moses to the prophets everything concerning himself. A few facts. Number one, a mouse to Jerusalem is about three and a half hours of walking at normal pace. Theologians tell you that if you're going to walk at normal pace from Emmaus to Jerusalem or Jerusalem to Emmaus, you're going to have to walk for three and a half hours. How many hours minimum did Jesus teach them? Three and a half hours. I don't think there's a greater teacher than Jesus. Teaching about himself, expounding. Did they know it was Jesus? So you can't. Now, do you agree with me, Pastor Tosin, that if they got back to Jerusalem and they started a Bible school on Jesus, they would sell out? Do you agree with me if they start master, ca- master class? <laughs> master class, um, Jesusology. I mean, they didn't hear from anybody. They heard from Jesus. It was not Moses telling them about Jesus. It was Jesus telling them about Jesus. Yet, when they left, they left with knowledge. That's all they left with. The Bible says they did not know who was working with them. Now, go and study it much later. He says, they said to themselves, did our hearts not burn? Do you know that thing burning? You say, I have to write it on Facebook. This is deep. This rev. Mm. Mm. Rev. And everybody will come around and say, this is deep. You see why many have knowledge, but there's no change in their lives. Now, can I show you something? Please, you may be seated. Look at this. Go back to verse 29, I believe. I want you to see something. You see, because um, this vision that we're talking of the Lord, where he makes himself real to you happens in intimacy, not in study. Not in study. It's not even in hearing the teaching of God's word. It's in intimacy. That's where he reveals, are you getting what I'm saying here? Now, there are tools of intimacy. Meditation is a tool of intimacy. Worship is a tool of intimacy. The communion table is a tool of intimacy. In essence, worship is not the end in itself. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So you can sing the songs. If you don't understand the essence of the act, you lose out on it. Now, I want to show you something. He says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures. How many scriptures? All the scriptures. The things concerning who? Himself. Now, look at the next thing that happens, verse 28. He says, and they drew nigh unto the village. Whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. All right, guys. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you guys. I'm going on my journey. Everybody read verse 29. Want to go. But they constrained him and saying, abide with us. Revelation happens when we abide. That's where it happens. Look at it. He says, for it, now, if this had not happened, if they did not constrain him and say, abide with us, if that did not happen, they would have left with notes full. The ability to communicate it. But you see no change in their lives. And the Bible says, as he broke the bread, and you know in, in the New Testament, breaking of bread was a sign of intimacy, covenant, co- cutting of covenants, the covenant of intimacy. The Bible says their eyes were open. Look at what it says. Their eyes were, can I have verse 31 there? Verse 31. Their eyes were open and they knew him. When did they know him? When he was expounding from Moses to the prophets? Come on, talk to me. Come on, talk to me. Was that when they knew him? When did they know him? You see, the biggest undoing of this generation is a lot of people who know everything that is right but are not abiding. That's the biggest undoing. The biggest undoing. You find people, and sometimes if, you, if, you, if you're not trained in these things, you find people who can, who can articulate it accurately. But you know they don't know 
who they are talking about. I know him whom I have believed. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying? I know him whom I've believed. Genesis 22. Go and read about it. Law first mentioned. When worship was first mentioned. Abraham said to them, he said, I and the lad will go up and what? Go up yonder and do what? Worship. You remember the story? And Bible students will know that by the law first mentioned, everything that is important to know about a subject is usually in the first place where it is mentioned. Now, when they went up to worship, what was the conclusion? What happened in that place? God opened Abraham's eyes and he saw the Lamb of God. He called the place, not God. He called the place Jehovah Jireh. It was not God. He called Jehovah Jireh. In the mount, you know we say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider? No. What it means, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Where's, what mount? The place of worship. My eyes will be open. And to let us know that he actually saw, Jesus came and said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. The power of worship. Somebody listen to what I'm saying here. When you see him, that success that is making you raise your shoulder, all of a sudden you realize there is more. I can't get swollen about this. When you see him, that challenge that looks like insurmountable, all of a sudden you have perspective. When the weary sees him, hope comes. When the weak sees him, strength comes. When the sick sees him, the sickness disappears. It's not the sight of your eyes. It is that moment in time. We take the song and we're worshiping. Remember I told you there are tools of intimacy. Worship is one of them. It's not the only tool. But I found out that it's one of the easiest tools. It's one of the fastest and easiest tools. Where you know that this is not just singing a song. It's a means to an end. Are you following what I'm saying here? Can I tell you something? You don't see what you're not looking for. You don't find what you're not pursuing. In essence, you use the songs as a means of pursuit. To release your desire and your hunger. Are you following what I'm saying here? I found out. Something powerful happens when we truly worship God. Not just sing because it's a nice thing to do. Something powerful happens. You leave that place sometimes, Odin's, you don't have the answer, but you have perspective. You, you may not be able to explain how the situation will be handled, but you just can't be afraid again. You can't explain it. Somebody says, what has happened to you? I don't know. I don't know what has happened. Tonight we are ascending. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying? We're going on a journey tonight. And I want you to open your heart and your mind. That's why you can't be bothered about what the person beside you is doing, what he's not doing. You can't be bothered about it. You can't be looking at if this person is worshiping or not. No. My greatest breakthroughs have come in worship. The greatest breakthroughs of my life have come in worship. That moment where I'm completely, completely lost before the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying? Completely lost before the Lord. Lift your two hands where you are and begin to worship him in the spirit. Just begin to worship him in the spirit. Just solemnly and quietly where you are. Tonight is your night of encounter. Some of you have been weak in your Christian walk. Today up, tomorrow down. Tonight something is going to happen. And you'll be set as it were. You'll find yourself set as literally set. You just can't move beyond this. You can't move backwards again. Something has happened on the inside of yourself. Close your eyes, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Spirit. And express your hunger, your desire for this Jesus. Express your hunger and your desire for this Jesus. He said, my beloved, he says, I found him whom my soul loveth. My beloved is mine and I am my beloved. Is there anybody here tonight who's going to travel on the wings of worship? Tonight we see Jesus. 
We are not living here with good songs. We are living here seeing Jesus. Tonight we see Jesus. This church will never remain the same. Your ministries will never remain the same. Yes, your life will never remain the same. Your walk with God will never remain the same. John the beloved walked with him for three and a half years. But on the Isle of Patmos, he said, when I saw him, my knees buckled. The very one he had laid his head on the chest. He said, my knees buckled. My knees buckled. Somebody with a loud voice worship him tonight. You can't be casual about it. You cannot be casual about it. You can't be turning right and left. Some people have this restlessness. You just have to see what somebody else is doing. No. No. Intimacy requires focus. Requires focus. Requires focus. Kosara diga bahashela mande bele diga bahaya. Don't wait for no song. Don't wait for no song. Sing to your Jesus yourself. Speak to your Jesus yourself. Tonight is that night. 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 For one minute more, for one minute more, with your eyes closed, gaze on the Lord Jesus. Just speak beautiful things to this Jesus. Raise an incense, an altar of incense tonight. Thank you, Lord.